Good morning, everyone. Um, it is, as Margaret said, amazingly um, July 29th or whatever date we're at. Let on me make on Monday, it will be August. <laughs> Monday, it will be August. Scary and thought. This, is, this is the elementary school building committee. And we do have a quorum, so I'm going to open the meeting. But I know um, at least one person said they'd be a bit late. So I will first go around the room and call out names to make people sure people can hear and be heard. We still are under the new governor's orders that allow us to be continued to meet by Zoom until next year, correct, Paul? We're mm -hmm. 2023. Um, so I am going to do a roll call vote of the names I see and just indicate that you can hear and be heard. Sean? Yes. Mike? Yes. Paul? Present. Tammy? Tammy, you need to unmute and then uh, Yes. Okay. Phoebe? Yes, hi. Hi, Simone? Yes. Okay, I didn't hear from anyone that they wouldn't be coming. So I think others will be joining us a little bit later. Um, so Margaret, if you want to um, start us off with today's agenda and um, Tim, Tim had told us one of the items on the agenda we won't be doing. So when you show the agenda, we can just note that. Um, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so um, we're going to start the meeting off by picking up where we left off last time with looking at the sustainability rating systems, So, which is a lot of uh, acronyms, which hopefully after with this conversation, you'll be more familiar with. Um, I think Daniska is going to give a bit of an update on some design work they're doing. Uh, just to jump in, that that's the point that uh, Kathy was speaking to. It's not going to be building plans. There are a few site plans, though, that yeah. we'd like to talk about. Exactly. Um, and then we're going to revisit uh, the what was the bulk of last meeting's conversation about procurement. Um, a few of us were able to visit schools Wednesday, and uh, we'll get a report on that, invoices, and that's it. So, so thank um, you. One just, thing, um, just quickly to flip to, so we are here in the schedule that um, Danisco had drafted originally. So um, Tim and Rick and Viviana and Donna, I think this item about the ground source versus air source is moving to a future meeting, right? Correct, that will not happen until at least uh, we have the next net zero meeting, which is scheduled for Thursday. Yeah. Okay. And this, um, as a reminder, this list of um, tentative schedule topics is in the packet from the last month's last meeting. So, okay. So Mark, I just want to add to what Tim said. I did send everyone that, um, and I see Ben is here. Ben, um, could you just hi, let us make know you can hear and be heard? Yeah. I'll yep, I can hear and be heard. Great. Um, and and so I just want to say that there is a meeting of the Net Zero Committee, as Tim just said, next uh, Thursday, August 4th. And I sent everyone the agenda for that. It'll be a pretty good discussion with some updates and I'll, I'll post them. Good news from Eversource. If we continue to target an EUI of 25, we get a substantial construction incentive. They'll, they'll be tough on making sure we can get there. Um, but, but when I said substantial, well over a million dollars um, toward the construction costs. So that will be part of the discussion. Anyone who's not on the subcommittee, it might be something that you would want to come in on. So I will stop talking now. And I think it's, it's um, you, Donna, and your team talking about lead and the rating system rating system options for sustainability thank you good morning everyone i'm gonna let tim go ahead and yep. talk about it i'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna jump right in
Can you see that? Yes, I well, at least I can. Yeah. Whoops, now it's gone. You lost it. Tim, do you have a PDF of that? Yeah, that's what I'm, doing. I'm switching to the PDF from there. There you go. Is that better? Yes, thank you. All right. Um, so jumping in, uh, the two systems that we you can use to document um, the performance and sustainability of buildings in general and schools specifically are LEED uh, and CHIPS. So CHIPS is collaborative for higher performance schools. It varies by region of the country. We would be in the New England region and LEED is leadership in energy and environmental design. Um, LEED is originally developed for building in general and was um, made specific to various uh, sectors, uh, schools being one of them, also hospitals, uh, commercial real estate, and stuff like that. Uh, but it is widely used, um, and CHIPS is specific for schools. Um, Tim, Tim, sorry, just, just to give everyone, just to just step back one second, MSBA requires that the project be certified. Either they support LEED and CHIPS, so um, either way, it's a requirement, and, I, and we understand that AMR supports doing this regardless. Um, so I just want to say that MSBA supports both. Yes, there's and a path to the additional MSBA incentive through either. There is not a required level of certification with either, but you have to be the base level plus a certain energy performance in addition to that base level of uh, certification with either rating system. Uh, so there are two levels in CHIPS, uh, which is verified and verified leader, and then in LEED, it's certified silver, gold, or platinum. Uh, the rating systems are similar, uh, but a, there are also quite a bit of differences between them. There are more points in CHIP, so it gets into a little bit finer level of detail. There are also more prerequisites. Um, so items that absolutely have to be hit, otherwise um, you don't get certified. Um, there are no prerequisites that we wouldn't be intending or expect to achieve, uh, but some of them are a little bit difficult, like acoustic performance uh, of the building in ships. Uh, and there's a little cost associated. So there is a, a discussion of which points you would always go after with the building. And so there's marginally less flexibility with chips. Um, the infrastructure associated with LEED is uh, somewhat more robust um, in terms of filing for credits, filing documentation. There's an online portal. Uh, there is a wide base of consultants that are very familiar with it. And any contractors that are working in the MSBA market are going to be familiar with LEED. That is not to say that CHIPS is unknown, but it is certainly less known and a, a bit more of a process to get um, all of the players at the table to file all of the documentation that was required with CHIPS. And then, sorry, Tim, just to add the cost to register and go through the process, you have to submit design and then construction, and there's a fee associated with those. Those two are uh, 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 similar. They are similar. And then the building that you will end up with um, will be almost identical, uh, probably would be identical depending on the rating system that is chosen. Uh, one difference is that there are more points in the chip systems that are related to operations and policies of the occupants of the school. Uh, that includes training for occupants to use the systems in the building as um, prerequisites, um, integration of the curriculum uh, with the building elements, um, display of the performance of the building is another point that is required in chips. These can be in lead, 
as part of innovation credits, but they are not required. Uh, so that's just one of the aspects where the chips system is a bit more specific to schools. And then lead. The breakdown of where the points are allocated are different. You can see here that um, in lead, sustainable sites, location and transportation and regional priority, those are all related to where the site is. So, you know, over a quarter of the points available are related to site location and site selection, whereas that's closer to 9% in chips um, and that's the, due to the fact that lead was developed for buildings in general uh, and it was designed to promote sustainable development by site selection and reuse uh, which is less of a factor in schools as you get to the breakdown of the other points um, you can see that energy is a little over a quarter in both of the models um, materials and resources and indoor environment quality um, sort of overlap in the points that are available in both rating systems. And then innovation in the lead system sort of is a catch-all that includes some of the operations and maintenance things that are um, required in chips. This is a great diagram, Tim. I've never seen this before, but it's really helpful. Yeah, it shows the two different approaches to um, where you can get the points and, you know, what is the focus. But at the end of the day, the energy and the quality is over half in both rating systems. It's too bad the colors aren't the same in the two different diagrams. Uh, I was just going to say the same thing. I'm it like, is a little ah. confusing, and I'm sorry for that, but there isn't a one-to-one, -one, uh, and I tried yeah. to get it, and then it, yeah, I've been thinking right. about that for a while. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> uh, Kathy, your hand is up. Yeah, I just have a qu question, um, Tim, for you. To, so one has water, and one has water efficiency. Would you just... What is water when they're looking at it? Is that like low flush toilets? Um, or... Exactly. Uh, so there, there, there's water in the building and there's water in the site, but um, the fine breakdown of the points. Um, but it is low flush toilets. Um, it's irrigation. It's management of rainwater. Um, and some of that falls under site but um it is those elements of water that is um measured and can you say the same on indoor air quality is that air exchange um uh do they windows that open uh, what what's in what's in indoor air quality besides so, air exchange yeah so there are several elements one uh vocs so paints adhesives, things like that. Um, there's also a particular matter, the level of filtration, um, and there are, and that also relates to materials, uh, but they, um, all of the things that you mentioned, air changes, operable windows are measured in various parts of the lead system. As, as yep. well as acoustics. Yeah, acoustics is a big one as well. Yep, and lighting, views um, are other elements that contribute to uh, indoor environment quality. Thank you. Um, this is just an example of some of the credit metrics. We've spoken about daylight a lot. Um, and so just to bring up uh, the minutia of one of the points. So you can see an example. Um, and this is not the full credit language, but only the meat of it. Um, for daylighting, in lead, you have to achieve a certain level of daylighting. 
a certain distance above the floor for a certain amount of time. And uh, it's 300 lux at three feet above the floor, which basically translates to whether you can read at a desktop surface without artificial lights on in the room. Um, and you can either do that by calculating it with a computer simulation or at certain times of the year, go in with a physical light meter and measure it. Um, and whether you get 55 or 75 or 90% of the floor, you get a different number of points. Um, it's a total of three points available for this or five points in chips. Um, the metrics are slightly different, but very close. And then I, you know, I, I go through the detail of this to point out that um, for those of you that were on the tour Wednesday, um, there were classrooms that were more light filled and less light filled, but none of them would meet the criteria set forth here as a frame of reference. Um, so I just, you know, as we get into a, a more meaningful discussion of daylighting uh, next week uh, and strategies and what we actually think a good way to measure uh, quality of daylighting in a classroom is, uh, we can speak about that related back to this and why or why not we will be uh, pursuing some of these points. Yeah, and, and just to add to this, you know, really the devil's in the details Tim, Tim is trying to suggest here. And so what we find with a lot of our clients is we still focus on the intent of some of the points that we're unable to achieve given the specific documentation or calculations, et cetera. So neither chips or lead, you know, take take a global approach. They really get into some minutia that almost makes some of these very difficult uh, to achieve. One, one other one is the on-demand credit, which you think would be something that we would be able to achieve. But in the end, it really becomes a sticking point with certain functions of the building. For example, on-demand is you have to um, adhere to Eversource if they say there's a brownout. And so what that's telling you is you're giving them control to shut down your building a certain part, certain times, whether you have a program in there. This just happened at one of our, for one of our clients, they, Eversource was like, well, brownout, shut down the building. And they had a program in school last week or two weeks ago during the heat wave and they, they shut the um, air conditioning off. So, so again, devil's in the detail, whereas sometimes it's just not prudent to pursue some of the credits. Helena, was that a school that that happened yep. at? Yep. Yep. So, wow. so when you sign up, you got to be careful, you know, what, what you're agreeing to. So that on demand was Eversource was having a brownout. And normally it doesn't affect schools, but you could see the other day you build it, they will come and you will use these spaces year round. And normally well, it's air conditioning, it's summer, it's really just administration that's in the building. Well, that's not the case anymore. So uh, when whenever source says brownout, we're shutting down your electricity or reducing it to 75%, you're, you, you have to shut off the air conditioning. So again, with other clients, they say, okay, we agree to this in concept, but we need to control when we can shut the building down and, or turn down the electricity to, to heat the building or cool the building, and we'll be responsible for making that decision. So I, again, it's just, it's just the devil's in the detail when we start looking at these credits to make sure that you understand what you're agreeing to. Um, and then just an overall of the pros and cons of the various systems before we just go through an example um, scorecard that was included in the PSR. Um, the pros of chips, it's school specific. Um, it was designed um, 
and created by people with schools in mind. Um, the cons are related to uh, a higher number of prerequisites. Uh, I mean, there's no wiggle room on some of the points. Uh, they are certainly all achievable points, but there are realities of budget and construction that sometimes you want some flexibility to deal with these things. Um, also, the review uh, is a bit more intense, uh, a, a little more, a few more points often get missed through the review process with chips than with lead. And they don't have the infrastructure that lead does as a national body um, that many more buildings go through. Uh, so the reviews tend to be longer. Um, some of the, the pros of lead uh, is the brand. Uh, it's if it allows people to know that you're pursuing uh, a sustainable building. Uh, the documentation process, as I have mentioned, is a bit more streamlined and more familiar with the, all of the people, contractors, owners, uh, design professionals that have to engage in the process. Uh, but there are, uh, on the downside of lead, there are a lot of credits that are unavailable simply by the nature and location of the project. Um, and we can get into that as we go through the scorecard. This is the scorecard that was submitted with the PSR. Um, you can see that the points allocated are broken down by the categories that we saw earlier in the chart. Um, I'm going to start with location and transportation. There are a lot of points that we are not achieving, uh, and that is simply because we are building on a suburban site. Um, the density is simply not there to support what LEED would expect to award some of these credits. Um, and that's not to say that that's a good or a bad thing. Um, there are the last project that we did in Springfield couldn't get some of these credits, and that's certainly a much higher density. Um, there will certainly be electrical vehicle charging, so we'll get that. Um, some people question why we don't get bike facilities credit. Um, to get that credit, you have to have a shower in the building, which we don't have, and you also have to be connected to a systems of bike paths or roads with dedicated bike lanes or limited speed limits. Um, so there are, it's just one example of a credit where many things are simply out of control of the project and not available. Um, under sustainable sites, uh, there is a bit more that is our control and we get many more of the points where we expect to, uh, and they are related to the design of the building rather than the location of the building or the surrounding environment. Um, open space is the amount of project area that is developed or building occupied and most certainly get that. Uh, I'll point out rainwater management is no. Um, and you would think that with all of the attention that we're paying to stormwater and water on the site that uh, we would be performing well. And we are performing well, but to get these credits, the way it's written in LEED, you basically have to have the site perform as if there was no building on it at all. And that becomes very difficult. Uh, light pollution, heat island reduction, which is limited to low color, uh, bright, light colored pavement and light colored roof. Um, these are things that are in control of our design and we can do that. Joint use of facilities uh, is one that we will certainly get with all of the use of the building. Uh, water efficiency, um, to get to Kathy's question, here are some of the things that are there. Uh, outdoor water use reduction, we typically get. Um, indoor water use, we specify the fixtures that are required to get this point. Um, it is likely that there will not be processed water, so that's one reason we won't be getting that point. Oh. Energy and atmosphere, we will do very well in this category. Um, based on the town's net zero bylaw and the priorities that you have stated for the project. Uh, grid harmonization is the 
credit that uh, that Don just referred to in terms of uh, demand load and renewable energy with the amount of PV uh, that will be included in the project, we will most likely get all of the points available. Um, under materials and resources and indoor environmental quality, uh, you know, with our experience of materials that we use in schools and the process, this is what we expect to reasonably um, achieve. Um, obviously, all of the materials haven't been chosen yet, uh, but we will choose them with um, these factors in mind. Uh, I'll point to the linoleum that some of you saw on Wednesday that is uh, a natural base material that uh, allows us to get some of these credits. And then we're... Rounding out uh, the LEED scorecard is innovation and regional priority, uh, where we will be able to get some credits. Innovation uh, would be uh, integrating the building and its use into the curriculum, uh, things like uh, outdoor planter gardens and the energy use of the building itself. And regional priority, while not filled out, uh, the USGBC has essentially a, a certain number of credits that count extra in certain areas. Um, and in the New England region, um, the renewable energy is one of them. So we'll probably be getting points there, but we, we don't know until we design, but there are likely a few more points on the table in regional priority. And so that brings us to 64 points, puts us well within gold. Um, and that is a conservative estimate of where we will look. We can you know, do a projection of what we would get with chips, but it would most likely be verified, not verified leader, but certainly well within what you would get or need to get the MSBA requirement for the additional two points. Um, that's big picture view of lead versus chips. And then some of the points we'll go into specifically next week with the net zero subcommittee. I don't think we need a decision today on a point system, but um, it's something we can think about. And if there are any questions, we can get back to. Cool. Uh, what's the cost of each of the programs? Uh, Donna, answer. So, so, well, the cost to register and um, go through the design and then the construction is really uh, uh, it's the square footage times a percent um, off the top of my head. I'm going to say it's about 20, 20,000, Paul, 15 to 20,000 off the top of my head. They're um, doing that in price. I'm sorry. They're, the, they're about the same price or ones. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're about the same price, but, but what that's the cost to register it and, and get your certification. When people say LEED is expensive or it adds cost to the project, LEED or CHIPS um, will add cost to the project, but that, that's because we're doing certain things inherent in the design of the project or the building to achieve those credits, right? Or to achieve a certain level of certification. But what we're finding is that that's really integrated into the design anyway. So we would want to achieve a lot of the credits anyway, but the actual expense to register and get certified is somewhere between, I'm gonna say 100, uh, somewhere between 15, and 20,000. So we, also, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. There's Brad. also a, a real administrative cost to contractors for the work that they have to do. And in the schedule of values, we typically ask each of these sections to have a lead submission or uh, basically break down the cost to uh, submit and upload the documentations that's necessary during construction. Contractors are required to do indoor air quality plans that they wouldn't have to do on a lead building, submit them and maintain and provide documentation. 
So there's a little bit of construction cost involved too, out, up, apart from the design effort. So we have to do, uh, MSBA says we have to do one of these two things. Right. And it Correct. seems like we're, you're saying administratively leads is easier, it's more familiar. Does it, is anybody choosing chips? Very, very few. Um, I think, and I don't really know, when we were looking for schools to go visit, we were finding that Jones Witsit Architects tends tends to favor chips, but other than that, when I was looking at everyone's projects, we were finding ninety percent are on are, are utilizing lead, and it, it's more recognizable um, to the community too, right? It, um, people understand and know lead and understand that that's all related to sustainability. So there's a little more a known factor and, and builds a little more credence to the to the project. Thank you. And you get a pretty plaque at the end. <laughs> Kathy? Yeah, I well, I wanted to do two things. One, Rupert, Elisha, and uh, Jonathan are here. So I, I just want to make sure that they can hear and be heard that they've joined the meeting. So Rupert, if you could unmute. Hi, everybody. Sorry, Hi, I was Rupert. late. Welcome. Uh, Alicia? Um, hello, everyone. I can hear you. Thank you. Great. And Jonathan? Good morning. I can hear I, you. Hopefully, you can hear me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. So I, I wanted to build on Paul's question on costs. It sounded to me there there is a labor cost to the town on chips. Um, when you went through that, the town is, has to file some policies that they certify we would adhere to. And there's some additional, It just that one little graph, Tim, you had. One is it was kind of easy to upload information. And one is a lot of document. Whenever I see anything that's a lot of documentation, it says to me labor costs. Um, is that true? It, you know, did I read those correctly? Um, so uh, that when I say labor discussions, time, time, time is what I'm looking at. Time, <laughs> not necessarily price tag. You are you're correct, Kathy. This. You're talking about staff time for the town. Yeah, staff time. Exactly, staff time. Yeah, staff time. Whether it's design team staff time or town town team staff time. <laughs> Yes. D am I reading that correctly? It says significant policy operation requirement often requires school board policies. I just was reading that to be something beyond what we've already written in the education plan, um, but maybe I'm misreading it. An example would be uh, there has to be a policy written that would be submitted as, that uh, outlines that uh, the buildings are going to be cleaned with um, sustainable cleaners. Um, there has to be a policy that elements of the building and its operation are integrated into the curriculum. Uh, if those policies or documents don't exist, they will have to be generated, yes, and submitted by the town. So there is certainly some time involved with the users of the building, town uh, employees, uh, that would be part of using the CHIP system as opposed to LEED. And just to build on what Tim said un under, under LEED, in innovation, very often you already have a policy on no smoking. Everybody's got it because it's a, a state reg. Uh, integrated cleaning, you likely already have, and you can get innovation credits for it. The uh, integrating curriculum uh, can be a lot of work. There are some others that can be considerable work and, and takes review, but the, the district uh policy portions of chips have all been very very easy in the pro projects and already in place in the projects that we've submitted in chips chips or lead rick i'm sorry lead sorry right and just to build from that as well is that um even if you don't so oftentimes we would submit a letter with the district's um letterhead basically confirming that these policies are in effect. So it, it's a 
fairly simple um, documentation. It's just a little bit of back and forth. So it's not very onerous. I think the difference in, in what we're saying is typically we still strive to integrate it into the curriculum to do other things in order to, they're not required, but in order to get certain points, um, we, we do these things with lead where with chips, it's mandated. It's a, they're prereqs, which, which is a little different. And there are times that we achieve the level that we need the extra two points for a full science program, including all the sustainable, we, is not required. So we don't have to ask staff to develop a curriculum that will support sustainability. That's not to say you don't want to do it, but it's at your leisure and you can incorporate it when you want to. So I think ultimately what we're saying is there will be support from the design Rupert's team 100%, um, but the level of detail that's required for chips is A, it's mandated, and B, it's, it, it's more formalized. Rupert. Um, thank you. Is there any difference uh, between the two uh, rating systems in terms of measurement and verification after the fact? The, the only, um, as part of the energy and atmosphere, there's a commissioning component. And so thanks to the MSBA, I, I, they're, they're awesome that they have enhanced commissioning built into the project that they pay 100% for Rupert. So if you weren't in the MSBA program and wanted to achieve this, the commissioning would be an added expense. But with MSBA, it's it's part of your project. And so, yeah, so we are, will actually get, I don't know the chips points, but for Lee we'll get automatically six points in energy and atmosphere for the commissioning, which is great. Sean. Is there a way to sort of integrate it with the requirements of the net zero bylaw in terms of commissioning. I know that that bylaw has some, um, yeah, just commissioning requirements after the building's done and then some 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 other requirements after the building's completed. Are the ways, are, are either one of these programs overlap more with what's in the net zero bylaw? They do overlap. Uh, that is to say that the commissioning will satisfy the requirements of LEED and the net zero bylaw. Um, there wouldn't be separate commissioning bodies that would address both. The, the only thing, Tim, that we need to verify is the level of detail required for the PVs because I, I don't know if MSBA, I, they should, as part of the commissioning, support the PVs, but typically they, they, they come don't. after the project. That can be challenging, Donna. You're right, because the standard contract that MSBA gives to all uh, commissioning projects, no matter uh, what the district, is pretty typical. And I don't think that the PEBs are on it. Yeah, but the, ge the ground source of the geothermal would be, because no. that's part of your system. But either way, you you're we're going to want to commission the PVs. So whether it's an expense for a lead or chips, it, we're going to have to just verify MSB will either pay for it or not. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, I'm just looking for hands. Um, I guess the only one I have, um, you said chips is not used as often. Have you ever in Donesco used chips or do you yeah. almost always use lead? Yeah, we, um, years ago, it was actually not New England chips, it was mass chips. So we used it on several schools in the early 2000s. We do it. We also used to be able to, to, to 
obtain a higher rating with chips when it was an ad reno. Yeah. They, they just gave more points to yeah. that. Um, but New England chips, it's kind of morphed from the mass chips program that goes all the way back to like, I think 2000, but, and it's trying to align itself more closely to lead. I think so, our last uh, chips project, Donna, was 13. There was the Danvers. Middleton. No, no Danvers Middleton. High School. Yeah, Danvers High School. Yeah, and prior to that, we had done um, a, a Middleton Elementary School. Right. Elementary school. They're both in 13. Yeah. Phoebe. Um, I guess I'm wondering, given that we are a school and if CHIPS is geared towards schools and maybe not just for us, but in general, why would it be that schools would choose LEAD over CHIPS if it's specifically geared towards a school building? Is that just because it's a little bit more stringent in terms of those policies you were talking about? Yeah, so um, LEAD has... As Tim was saying, they have a residential, commercial, um, maybe even healthcare, and then healthcare, schools. Labs. They have a lot of labs. Schools. So, so we would be registering lead under lead dash s, which is for schools. And so they try to tailor it a little bit more to schools. The difference, Phoebe, is that. CHIPS is mandating you do certain things where LEAD gives you that option um, to do various things. But we always try to maximize the credits and all of those, as Tim was alluding to, fall under this innovative design credits where you can pick up additional credits for integrating it mm -hmm. into the curriculum or as Rick mentioned, making sure there's a no smoking policy or, you know, some of them are kind of silly, but, or making sure that your um, cleaning supplies are all green, right? So CHIPS makes it more mandated where LEAD gives you the option. So I'm not seeing any other questions. Tim, you said you're going to come back to some of the sustainability issues around daylighting next week. Um, so I can't remember when I did the agenda. Of, I might have said and other issues to leave you up. <laughs> what, what, what you did. Did, I, did I say it, Margaret? Okay. Yes, you did. <laughs> okay, John, John, it's please. always there. <laughs> okay. We appreciate the flexibility. Yeah. Okay. So so I think um, one of the things we talked about, um, I'm going to say we can move to the next agenda item, but one of the things we talked about when we were looking at the two schools is the sense of daylight and the sense of control of lighting. Um, and so if we could talk about that next week, it would be great. You know, what what choices do we have as we're thinking of the design of the school if, um, if we want to maximize the the fact that a lot of things can happen on a sunny day without the lights on or um in in, in the classroom in the places that have windows clearly you know um as opposed to places that don't so that would be great if we can expand on that to sort of you can talk about the two buildings or if there are any other buildings we can see because it it it's helpful i found it really helpful to see see places to understand what might or might not be possible? Yeah, so I think we're, we absolutely understand the importance that daylighting has to Amherst and we 100% support it. Again, it's just making sure that we meet all of the other criteria of the, re, you know, the low EUI and all of that. So even if we collectively choose not to achieve certain lead or CHIPS credits, we still want to do the best we absolutely can as far as daylighting is concerned. So is everyone ready to move to the next topic, which I, yes, is contracting, correct? It's the one we heard um, an explanation and 
you need, uh, I think you're asking for a decision from us, whether we're doing design, bid, build, or uh, construction manager at risk. Um, so well, I I don't, I think um, we don't have anything more to present on that. So right. um, I think this is a good time to do it because as the designers really set to on updating the design, we're going to get into the, start to really get into more detailed design. So this is a good day to do it if we can take it up today. Well, Margaret, also, I think uh, there's paperwork that needs to be done and you have to go to the AG's office. So, and that takes time and we do need the state's approval to move with the CM at risk. So the sooner we can do it, the better, if that's the preferred solution or method. Well, yes and no. I mean, the real timeline issue, the AG's previously approved a CM at risk for this project. Um, so, uh, the timeline the timeline issue is that we really want to have the CM on board as soon as possible. So we would want to start the procurement. And it's the procurement timeline, which is, as I mentioned at a previous meeting, it's a two-step process. So first there's a qualifications procurement, and then there's a sh some short list of those who respond, uh, provide competitive pricing for their general conditions as a second step. That will take, that entire process will take a couple of months if the committee decides they want to pursue that step. And the sooner we have the CM on board, the sooner they're able to add value to the schematic design process. So as chair, I'm just going to ask um, Paul and Sean if you have any thoughts or have been discussing this. I mean, I, I think all of us saw that in the estimates that we had from the cost estimators, there's a price difference. Um, and it wasn't uh, a rounding error of, of difference. It was in the millions. So I just, any thoughts on um, it? Uh, either one of you. Yeah. yeah, I mean, go ahead, Sean. Is it okay if I just make a motion? And then we can, so I move that the committee uh, move forward with the design bid build option uh, for selecting a contractor. Second. Just who, who seconded it? Paul. Paul. Okay. And I'll just say quickly, you know, my reasons are, I think as Kathy alluded, the cost is quite a bit lower and we know cost is gonna be a, a key component for this project. Um, and I heard a lot of confidence from the design team with the specific project that they feel comfortable with that option. Um, and I think the expectation with any option we pick is that we're gonna get a you know really high quality building. Um, and so with the design team's confidence, I feel confident. Does anyone want to speak to that on a yes but or yes in favor, Mike? I just want to support Sean's motion. Uh, you know, we want the best building, right? Sean's on the financial side. I'm more on the educational side, but but those two, um, it's not a, it's a false dichotomy, right? They, they affect one another. Uh, and if we are able to have an effective building being built in a model that um, puts money instead of being into the construction piece, but into the, the the 50 year use of the building and the things that the community is asking for, I think that's the way to go. So I just want to support Sean's motion. Thank you. Jonathan. Uh, I agree with what's been said already. I'm very comfortable with the project moving forward as a, as a design bid, bid, design bid, build uh, contracting approach. Rupert. I would also like to support the motion. Uh, it's my feeling that the more uh, people who are actually building the building can be involved uh, the better the product in general. Uh, and I think it's a good idea. Thank you. So I'm not seeing any, any other hands, but um, I'll just, I, I thought one of the things that was stressed um, in the presentation that the construction manager matters in both. Um, and so that making sure we have a construction manager who's uh, familiar with the pieces of the project, not, including the geothermal, if we go that route, will be important. Um, but yes, I'm in favor of this motion. Phoebe? 
Um, I, I think I'm in favor of this motion. I would like to ask one last time before we officially vote on this, uh, both for the designers as well as the rest of the committee, if anyone has significant second thoughts about this and why, if there are any. I just want one last opportunity for, for to, you know, to hear people say one way or another. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so just, just from our perspective, we do both. I, I would say we're probably 50-50 uh, CM mm -hmm. versus hard bid. I think you have great experiences with both and you can not have a good experience mm -hmm. with either. And really it's incumbent upon the design team with the support of the OPM to just hold people accountable for what they own. Yeah. And um, our construction documents are so well documented and we enter construction with a not adversarial relationship with the contractor. We're always, we, this is a partnership or a marriage for two plus years, right? So we always go into it looking forward to working with these um, contractors. So Danisco is 100% comfortable going with design bid build. If this was a different project, if it was a renovation addition, that would be a different story, especially if there were students in the building, but we don't see a huge value add to a construction manager with this project. Margaret. Well, I want to see if any of the committee members have anything to say first. I'm not seeing any other hands up, Margaret. So I think. Okay. I'm... So um, we've actually done much more CM at risk work than design bid build work, but that has been because many of our projects have been on really tight urban sites and um, have not, there hasn't been the opportunity to keep a whole school in um, fully sort of operational while a building was built adjacent to it. So as I said um, at the presentation two weeks ago, I think the complexity here is really in the building systems. And I, I am supporting this approach because I think that this is an every dollar matters. I do think we may wanna provide some more capacity on our side in terms of oversight of the design and installation of the geothermal and pole and solar systems, but I think this is a really good approach. We may bring someone else onto our team, bottom line, in order to help make sure that all of that is thoroughly coordinated. Thank you both. So I'm not seeing any other hands up uh, for discussion. So I think we can move to a vote. And I will, um, I can do, actually I could do it in alphabetical order. I have that list. <laughs> so I'll do that so I don't miss anybody um, of the people here. And in this case, a yes or an I vote would be for design bid build. Um, so Paul. Yes. Uh, Simone. Yes. Allison is still absent. Ben. Yes. Sean. Yes. Phoebe. Yes. Mike. Yes. Rupert. Yes. Jonathan. Yes. Kathy's a yes. Uh, Tammy. Yes. And Alicia. Yes. It's unanimous with two absent. Unanimous yes with two absent. So thank you. So uh, next on our list is uh, reports on the site visits um, that those of us who did it, who went on a site visit on Wednesday, we, we went to two schools, one was in Needham and one was in Lexington, two different architects. The second school, the one in Lexington, it was the Danesco team and Vivian was the lead on it. And I just, I wanna start out by thanking 
the design team because everybody came and it was really useful to be able to be asking questions after between and amidst on why was one school this way or that. We didn't organize a, um, our thoughts. Uh, so I thought what I might do if, if Tammy, both Tammy was on the trip as was Phoebe, as was I, um, and then, uh, let me just think, and Mike. So there are four of us who were on the trip. In addition to, we had um, one of our frequent public commenters as an architect, Bruce, Bruce came on. So Bruce will probably make a comment during the public comment period. But I don't know whether anyone wants to lead off on thoughts um, on, on site visit and we can, write these up, we just didn't coordinate enough. And we took a lot of pictures. So we were thinking we would create a little picture, picture book too of things we particularly liked um, in either building or, or didn't like in either building or combos that we were thinking about. So Mike, Tammy or Phoebe, do any of you wanna raise your hand and Mike, here we go. Yeah, uh, I'll just summarize some of my thoughts. I think uh, a couple of take homes for me. One was the schools weren't the same size. They were similar size in the overall scheme of things, but uh, I experienced them as feeling very different in terms of the size and scope of the school. I think one of the bill, and I'm trying to be intentionally vague because I'm not trying to critique any designer or any you know, school or school community, but um, you know that was one of my learnings that day was the design really influences the feel. Um, Second was really about color, uh, and that's connected to the first, but not the same as the first. There were really different viewpoints. One, you know, on the flooring, they both had the same general product, but one had a tiled product, which I think my friends Rupert and Ben are going to like, because if it gets damaged, then you just replace a tile of it. Um, even though it's that soft material, it's not like a ceramic tile. Uh, one was kind of a flat surface. And, and so, you know, another one of my learnings was really thinking through the uh, you know, we had finance, uh, excuse me, um, facilities folks on each of the tours and hearing from them about what was the lived experience of being there. Um, that was uh, another one. Um, one of the schools had a really large space in the hallway for that kind of, uh, kind of small group space. And the other one, much more like we're thinking about had the small, smaller, more frequent areas and, and any reservations I had about having smaller, more frequent spaces is gone because, the large area just, it, it didn't feel like it worked. Um, uh, kind of, uh, sorry, I'm just running through a laundry list, but I just wanna give people a sense without taking half an hour. Um, uh, the location of where the library, you know, gym, all those things are, I think when we revisit that, I think, you know, I got a better appreciation for some of the implications, particularly as it relates to community use uh, and how you can lock off a building um, bathrooms was another one that was interesting. Both buildings had doorless bathroom entries. Um, they had slight differences about that, um, but sort of the airport style. Um, but the design really worked. I, I, you know, you know, it, I know it sounds funny to people, perhaps, but uh, I, I thought that worked well. They had one of the schools for their kind of um, space for de-escalation had. Uh, uh, a window where the light could be turned on, where it was transparent or could be turned off, where it was opaque um, to provide privacy and depending on the moment and just having that flexibility was a feature that stood out to me. Uh, and it was great to have Yvette, who's our specialized special education person there, she just started, uh, but has a lot of experience in the field, offered her able, able to offer her insights. And then the last thing I'll say, just the exterior space, um, you know, I strongly favored one versus the other uh, for a couple of reasons. One, the flow. I think I was walking with Tammy and Tammy rightfully was saying, where could one teacher be and see kids doing different activities from a supervision perspective? Um, and, and there was a real difference there. Uh, also outdoor learning spaces that weren't play spaces, but, you know, truly for uh, more classroom or small group activities were different. And then the, the, the other thing I'd say is one of the outdoor spaces was really well designed for year round use. The reality is close to half the year in New England, uh, it's gonna be messy outside uh, for kids to be out. And one had really thought through and, and purchased a machine that would clear off um, some hard space. You know, uh, the facilities person said it's never a problem. They do it all the time uh, and it doesn't damage the 
kind of flooring and the images of like four square quartz and all that. And, and one had sort of a, a soft uh, turf field that also could be used throughout the winter and cleared off. And um, it wasn't like something you'd think about at like a high school with a soccer field or football field, uh, but it provided year round access for physical exercise. And uh, that was really appealing to me because we know, you know, research as well as lived experience tells us that that physical exercise in the winter is really crucial uh, and having capacity to pull that off is really important. So that was really quick, but that's like the summary of sort of my reflections and learning because I did write up some notes afterwards, which I'm reading off of summarizing uh, anyways right now. Um, but it was a really, I, I second Kathy's thoughts, it was a really great experience. And I think Margo was on the call, uh, our intern here in the summer. So thank you, Margo, because it's great having someone with fresh eyes on it. Um, I think, oh, I'm sorry, one other thing that I just want to note uh, more for Rupert and Ben, but for everyone aesthetically, but also um, maintenance wise was the exterior materials. One school had a lot more um, either wood or wood looking material on the outside and, and one uh, didn't have that model. And I think that'll be something that the community really will want to weigh in on because it, it really was, both were beautiful on the outside and they weren't similar. Like you wouldn't get confused. If you saw a picture of the schools, you'd go, oh, I'm at that one. I'm at, you know, it wasn't, there was, there was no, uh, there was no, uh, oh, they look the same, not at all. And so uh, that brought in my scope in terms of the decisions that this committee will, will be engaged in making. Phoebe? I hope everybody can hear me. I'm also working right now. So I'm outside. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I wholeheartedly agree with, you know, pretty much everything Mike said. Um, what was so interesting to me um, as having this be the first time that I have gone and been able to see not just the outside of the school, but the inside of the school was um, how very different they were. So the two schools had a lot of similar features, but how they incorporated those features into the design for that specific school felt very different. For instance, like Mike was saying, the, you know, the, I don't know what they call them, but the, the common, more common, like shared spaces, like in between the classrooms kind of thing. Um, those were very different spaces. At one school, they were giant and wide open to like the hallways. And at the other school, they were um, still, still open spaces, um, a little bit smaller, shared between fewer classrooms. Um, but there was also a separation. So, you know, I have a nine-year-old and I can imagine something being as big and wide open as one of the schools, you know, the distraction factor for um, a child who's trying to do some small group work or group with a class, you know, uh, work with a class or something like that. Um, you know, it, it was differences like that that really stood out to me. Um, I actually found, um, I think they, I know that the first school we saw was about 92,000 square feet. I forget what the second one was, but I was struck when we got to the second one because of the orientation of the building. Um, it didn't look as giant as the first one did um, until you, until we got outside and went to the back of the building and then you could see the entire expanse of the building. Um, but that was something that really struck me. Like it can be a giant 100,000 square foot school and it doesn't have to look like a 100,000 square foot school from uh, depending on how it's laid out on the site. Um, I, I, you know, I obviously am not somebody who's going to be doing recess duty and that kind of stuff, but there was definitely uh, the difference in the outdoor space in both of the schools was, was a little bit shocking to me. I definitely favored one over the other. Um, and it, it was incredibly illuminating to be able to talk to Tammy about it, what, what kinds of things she was looking for as somebody who, who is doing that on a regular basis, out watching many kids on the playground. Um, but also because we have a site that is not just um, used for kids to play at recess. It really is a site that our community uses for a number of things. Um, and so to be thinking about how we can both uh, best use it for in-school times, for kids at recess, for um, break times, things like that, um, that also make it easier and more convenient for teachers and staff and at the same time 
um, you know, mesh that very well with how the community then will use the additional fields and everything else. Um, that's something that I want to, when we get to that point, think very uh, uh, sort of clearly and really spend a lot of time there. Um, and I also think one of the things that I said, I think to both Donna and Margaret, um, when we were looking at outdoor space was like, we should, you know, I said to them, have you seen the new Groff Park or, you know, I mean, I think that we could take some time and look at what works and what doesn't work for outdoor spaces around us. Cause I think that we're lucky enough to have a lot of outdoor space in our town and surrounding towns um, that we can take some examples from. Um, and so, you know, being able to do that, um, I feel like would be, would be really fantastic. But overall, it was really nice to have the uh, two different schools to look at as long of a day as that was. It was nice to be able to see the two, to be able to, to almost pick and choose and say, you know, I really like the way that this library was laid out. Um, or I really like the way that this cafeteria was, was uh, oriented. Um, and to be able to sort of, uh, in my own mind, figure out why this would work better than that to be able to then come back and, and really talk about those things in, in layout and everything else. Um, that was it, thank you. Tammy. Um, so I, I feel really lucky because I've gotten to visit Springfield and now Needham and Lexington. Um, and I have to say that, the, you know, just upon entering the school, the, the Needham school just had that wow factor. Wow, I'm so more special kind of feel to it. Um, and so I'm going to try and be as brief as possible <laughs> and also organize my thoughts simultaneously and try not to repeat anything. Um, but it, it did make me feel special walking into that building. Um, and at the same time, a lot of the design elements were incorporated a lot of like the outside, um, including the inside tiling was to mimic like birch trees, which I thought was fascinating. Um, so one of the differences I noticed between the Lexington and the Needham School was just like the interior design. I think the Needham School um, allowed like had the the walkways it within the building was much more leading um, and and allowed for students to really orient themselves in the hallways, which I, which I thought was a really fascinating way to design that. Um, I think that the uh, walking into the Lexington school felt a little, uh, the way the office was designed felt a little more cumbersome to me. Uh, but I do, in terms of the internal structures, I really like the Lexington School in terms of how the community learning areas were designed, um, allowing for people to still be in the walkways, but not to distract from the learning that might, might be going on in sort of a, a common area. Uh, I, I like the, the amount of student artwork um, that occurred, the solar parking. I felt that the the design of the outside for either student pickup or bus was was a, a, a strength at the at the Lexington School. Um, I also the other big thing that I noticed between the two schools was the lighting um, and and the shifting between. I felt that the Needham School did a many of the shades were open and they were, or at least it felt like they were open and they, you could really see the outside and the beauty of the outside versus at the Lexington school. I felt like a lot more of the classrooms had their shades closed and it particularly bothered me in the art room because I felt like when you're doing art, you want to have your windows open, you want to have, and I just think about that um, as a teacher, but then also as a student, I want to see so many of the elements of the outside when I'm in as well. Um, and I think there was something to do. I know I talked to Margaret about this um, and, you know, it was, I understand it was like the orientation of the building, but I also noticed when I was reviewing the pictures that the the, the Needham School may have had longer windows and the top was sort of screened off. And then the bottom, um, you could definitely see the outside, which was gorgeous. I mean, it was it was well landscaped. And, and I think, you know, in that vein, and I know um, 
both uh, Mike and Phoebe spoke to this, but the outside, there was definitely a difference of feel. Um, and in terms of the, the design and the layout, like I felt like even though one of them had a smaller playground, the layout of it made it feel big and, um, and, and much easier to, to watch students, um, I felt. But it really, it, it felt like a, a community area, a, a place that I would wanna bring my own kids to, um, something that kids would look forward to every day. Um, but then as a teacher and, and from a safety perspective, I felt like really good <laughs> um, being able to see everything that was going on. But I also felt like um, when I think about my the students in my building and the students in our district that have mobility issues, I felt like one of the playground areas had many more options. So it felt much more inclusive um, to me. Uh, so, so that was something to, to consider. For me, those are some of the considerations for me. So I'll, I'll just add a few things. Um, I, the when Phoebe said the school's size felt different, the school that was 110,000 square feet felt smaller than the 92,000 square foot school. And I thought both visually when you came in it, but even when you were in it. So this notion of long hallways versus community space. So I think it's something we've already got in our design, which is a plus. Um, did It was a feeling of space. We were all surprised. You get sort of asking, which do you think was the bigger schools? And we get you would guess wrong based on your feeling. The other is, um, we were just talking about daylight in the classroom, but I was struck by thinking about, and I hadn't thought about this before, where we put the art room and where we put the cafeteria um, in terms of rooms that are gonna have outside. If you're on the north side of a north-south building, you're more protected from the, the strong sunlight during the day. And I think one of the schools, the art room, one was in east-west, you know, it's hard to compare them because one was east-west and when you have to have the blinds down. And so where, how you bring the light in um, and where you're gonna go outside from a building. The, the cafeteria, and forget the first cafeteria, but the second cafeteria, and then the library was on the first floor, but they, it had an indoor window to the hallway. So the hallway was lit by the fact that the cafeteria was lit. You know, So there was a real airiness feeling to it. So I was just thinking about which side of the building these rooms are on, we should be thinking about. And then on the outdoor space, what, what Tammy was talking about on the entry to the first school we went to, they had a whole bunch of gardens and uh, things maintained. It wasn't plant gardens, but it was also tomato plants, clearly kids. But I thought, you know, do you want the gardens on the south side of the building or on the north side of the building in terms of, and they were a little bit protected by, uh, uh, sort of a heat sink and there were bio, there were rain gardens. So some of the things we've talked about having on our outside that made the whole surrounding of the school really interesting. And I, I think we have the same landscape and outdoor person that was on the school. We really liked the outside, but trying to think of what's on the south side, what's on the north side, what's on the east and west, since we had this giant site at Fort River. We, we were not pushed by a road to say it could only be on this side of the building versus that side, which the one school was pushed by the, the size of the site to kind of scrunch everything together. So those were just things that I wouldn't have seen if I hadn't seen two schools. So I thought it was really useful to see two because one had more leeway of what's in front, what's in back um, and the pickup uh, and as Tammy just said, the one had really thought that through. The other thing I should say, I mean, Rupert, you weren't with us uh, and Ben, but the uh, Lexington school is geothermal and it's got PV. So you can park your car under a canopy and it wasn't hot when we got in it. That was really nice because this was such a hot day. None of us wanted to be outside in the sun, but um, it was quiet inside and the air 
had a really nice feeling everywhere. You know, you weren't too cold and it wasn't shifting when you went from room to room. The engine room, I'll call it an engine room, the facilities room was mind boggling. It looked like something out of, um, you know, a sci-fi fictional thing with these, with these giant things coming in and out. But they, the maintenance and the facilities person who took us around initially, he's in charge of all the schools. And he said, to, they can see everything on a central panel if something is or isn't working. And the local people can alert them, but they, they are more just running the system. So it was an integration of, you know, overview. Um, that I think I thought it was great to see because we saw a system that's like the HVAC system we're potentially talking about for ours. Um, and the the air just felt good. The the other school, in contrast, it had its air conditioners on, and it in some places it felt really cold, in other places not. You know, so the the ability to to you know someone was saying turn it down or I've got to go get my sweater. Um, you know, in the middle of the day. So so thank you thank you for arranging it because it was really really helpful to see these. Um, spaces. And I know one of the things you've been thinking about is to what extent it affects the layout of our spaces, um, you know, and outdoors. So uh, uh, it'd be great to see what you come up with as, would you want to do this rather than that? Um, so. So thank you. And thanks everyone that went. And I, I'm hopeful that we can see a completely different design, uh, maybe the beginning of August. So just to, you know, have, have another opportunity to see a totally different school and just kind of to confuse you even more, but, but I, we, you know, for us seeing, seeing as much as possible and we intentionally pick those two schools, one of them wasn't ours, one was, but it wasn't even so much for that. It was more how different they were. And this, at least one other school that we were looking at, we might even go look at a couple of others because they have some features that we've been talking about, not our designs, but what's important is the user experience, right? And I know it was in the middle of the summer, so we couldn't quite have the opportunity to ask the teachers or their staff, what do you like, what don't you like? It was interesting um, at the first school, we went in to see the nurse and it wasn't the nurse's real building. So she opined on the space, what she liked, what she didn't like, but she doesn't use it year round. So that's kind of the disadvantage for doing it in the summer, but they were both fully used. So you build it, they will come. Um, we are really happy to say that Bill Brown, our landscape architect was actually on both, on both projects. So you can see the vast difference um, there was more opportunities with one than the other, but it was also what was important and to both communities, you'll see where the emphasis was with their money. And I think that will be an important discussion and consideration. We had amazing outdoor learning areas and everything else at, at the Hastings School, the second school, and when we started looking at how are we gonna reduce the cost, they did not wanna take away from the educational experience inside. They did not wanna take away from the maintenance and durability or the equipment and materials. So what was left was some of the outdoor amenities. So you know, it's going to be a balance on what's most important to you all and how we can achieve everything. Um, probably with some compromise, but we'll, we'll get through it. But you can see the differences in, in how the communities chose to use their resources. And I think if we go to the Beale School, maybe High Plain, I think, oh, just the Plain School, whatever, but that will give you another opportunity to see. And those, that, those are different designers as well in totally different communities. Again, where do they choose to use their resources? But um, I think with that said, we can actually start talking about the site design. If we have a couple of minutes, we've started looking at how we can incorporate outdoor play, outdoor learning. Tammy, I think a lot of your observations 
and you know we saw you in the library at the second school going this is great because i can see every i can see you all <laughs> but that's what it's about like like you don't want these little kids like taken off on you and we know that you have some special needs students that really are going to need oversight and so when we start looking at these spaces, when we start designing the spaces, when we start getting to the room data sheets, all these meetings that we're trying to set up, all of these discussion points need to come up and we need to understand and hear from you. But with that, Tim, I think if it's okay, Kathy, if we can start just talking about. We have a few site plans that we just like to talk about that uh, sort of some tweaks on what you've seen already and 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 so we can start to discuss how we would want things to move and be organized. Uh, yeah, Tim, Tim you just, Phoebe just raised your hand. So I just want to make sure we get that before you, Phoebe. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, so Vivian, this I think this is actually for you. When we were at um, the Lexington School, I think you said that 22% of the uh, outside the, the building space was window. I don't know that I said that right. But so I it's it's a window to wall ratio that feeds okay. into the energy model that then feeds into the whole efficiency of the school. So I think we're at about 22%, uh, meaning the amount of windows in comparison to the amount of building envelope is 22%. And do we know what it was for the Needham School? Um, we don't. Uh, I, I actually asked uh, Catherine from facility oh. if it was a number that they talked about and she didn't have it at her fingertips. Yeah. Okay. All right. That would be interesting because there was something about the amount or the placement or the size of the yeah. windows that had a very big difference. And I'm wondering if it's just there were more or if there was something of you know, about those windows that had a different feeling. So thank we, you. Yeah, we can try to get that information. And you're right, when I walked into the Needham School, I um, was really amazed at the amount of glass that was up high. It was like every single classroom had kind of a wall-to-wall -wall expanse of glass up high. So that got me thinking about, oh, what is that yeah. percentage? So, um, you know, we know some folks at the architectural group, so maybe we can try to get that info. We'll let you cool. know. Thank you. Okay, Thanks. And Vivian, mean, just when you're doing that, um, I can't remember whether both did this, but the Lexington School had glass wall to ceiling glass in the stairwell. And one of our thought is, could it have a big window rather than that much to have daylight? You know, so it was good because the stairs were well lit. So it was just a question on that's part of that ratio too, um, as, as you look at it. Yeah, and I think the other part to bringing in natural light into the corridors or other areas is also important. I don't know if you got the same sense, but it's what you see when you're going down the corridors. One school didn't even have windows in some of the stairwells. And so the natural light wasn't, you, you weren't taking advantage of natural light into the corridors and such. So for us taking a holistic approach and how we can bring in natural light into the building without adding cost or um, window to wall ratio. And I, I, the Needham school did not, I know it's not net zero. They didn't have solar um, canopies. I didn't go on the roof. I don't know if they had solar on the roof. They do they have PV on the roof. Yeah. And, um, they don't have geothermal or ground source or air source. So it was also, well, it was built about the same time. So that was completed in 19, ours was completed in 20, Hastings was completed in 20. But the emphasis with Lexington is they're kind of Amherst on the east side of Massachusetts, where they want to be net zero, et cetera. So a lot of discussion was how can we make this building as energy efficient as possible. And that was really important. So, and that was also an all electric building com compared to the Needham building. And I don't, I don't know what the, we'll see what the wind to wall ratio is. And that might also be telling. Okay, 
Tim, you're on. And you're muted. Thank you. Um, all right, so can you see that site plan? Yeah. So this is very close to the last site plan you saw with some minor tweaks. Uh, one of the changes is the drop-off building to the west, the drop-off loop to the west of the building has been extended down in front. Um, when you last saw it, it was shorter. Uh, but the general concept is there is play and outdoor learning distributed around the building. Uh, there are athletic fields to the north and south. Um, and then drop off loops for buses and cars on different sides of the building to separate the traffic. Um, this is imagined with buses to the south and cars to the west and extending to the north of the site. Uh, but the geometry of both is such that it could be reversed if it worked better that way. Um, and then, so this shows a combination of hardscape and planting around the building um, with stations for structured play and outdoor learnings distributed about. Um, what you see here as blue is a stormwater management feature, uh, which would be similar to uh, what you saw at Senator Williams or with, with um, stones, uh, it would not be standing water at any point. And, and thanks to the drought, you could see there was no water <laughs> what we saw in Needham. And so we begin to just look at different organizations and moving things around the site with the constraints as we understand them a little bit more. What this does is push the building to the south um, it was originally, you know, less than 20 feet away from the original building. This is a little bit more than 100, which gives you a little bit separation for construction. What this does also is concentrate all of the outdoor play and learning on one side, the north of the building, um, and then the south of the building is mostly for drop-off and a service entry uh, that wouldn't happen during drop-off and pickup, and then the athletic field that was to the south of the building is moved to the east. Um, this zones all of the uses on the site uh, a little bit more concisely. Any student that leaves the building to go to outdoor play, outdoor learning, or to use the athletic fields is never crossing a drop-off loop or parking in any way. Um, so that, you know, we're moving towards a, a, a slightly higher safety considerations, not that they weren't there before, but it just makes everything a bit more easier and controllable. And then another version of this um, keeps all of the outdoor play and learning around the building distributed like the first option, but aggregates all of the um, outdoor recreation to the northern part of the site so that you have center for zone. Um, these are the, you know, the big levers that we can push in the site design um, as we, you know, figure out really what we can build up against, what we can build to, uh, how far we can get away from the existing building. Um, with the building pulled a little bit south and uh, some extra space to deal with, we can think about how we might reorganize the spaces in the building. Um, the plans that we have shown you to date have the cafeteria facing south and the gym to the north. Uh, but if we were to move in the direction of this option, it would probably make sense to have the cafeteria facing the north. It would be direct uh, to the playground, the outdoor learning spaces. If there were parent drop off at the loop on the left of the building, um, the cafeteria makes a good collection point for dismissal and arrival in the morning for anyone that's not going straight in the door. Um, and so this is the very start of the process of looking at these big pieces, how they inform the location of the pieces in the building and or how the location of the elements in the building, classrooms, cafeteria, gym, uh, push and sort of pull site elements to be where they want to be. Um, we're really just looking for any initial thoughts and feedbacks today, no decisions, just um, with the tours fresh in your mind and how those relationships work. Uh, we just wanted to put this in front of you to see if and, there's any and, reaction. And there may be components of, of one option that 
you feel strongly about that we could then um, rejigger and have a hybrid. So it's really great to hear some of your thoughts. And Tim, I, I, I might have missed it, but um, some of the differences for the drop off that's on the south is that by this option provides the opportunity to move the car drop off to the, the loop. So it's, it's longer, it provides a little bit more queuing space than the other options, which we were looking at as for bus drop off to the south. So just a little clarification. I think Sean had his hand up first. It's okay if I ask, sure. Kath, um, just a couple of questions. So I like the, I like the options uh, that don't have the students crossing the the bus loop there. So I think the B and C look nice. Um, actually, they all look nice, but, um, and I may have missed this. The blue on the diagram is, is that water? So that that is the stormwater management features. So that uh, it, it's, uh, we can show some example image. There will never be, except in the middle of a very serious rain event, any standing water, uh, but it is how the water is distributed through the site, absorbed into the ground and cleaned before it is discharge and then there can also be planting and uh, various other things in there that can be integrated into the curriculum but it, it is not standing water okay the way, are those feature. the way it looks for some reason the way I was looking at it, are those bridges over the water they are walking past and maybe okay so maybe you would, would so the way to get to the kind of around the stormwater system you would walk over one of those mm -hmm. walking paths you wouldn't just walk through the is it like a kind of almost like a um, like a trench kind of thing that might have rocks or plants in it? It's almost like a stream bed. If you can imagine a stream mm -hmm. bed that is mostly dry, but during after storm events, there okay. might be water still meandering through. But most of the time you'll see, you know, kind of plant material and um, rocks and boulders. Okay. So here are examples of landscape features similar. Um, they could be more or less um, uh, able to walk across uh, in terms of whether or not you would have to take the bridge, whether it's deeper with more planting. Uh, but these are, is just the very start of uh, incorporating the uh, elements of the site that allow it to work and deal with the water uh, and uh, have some natural habitat and uh, provide learning opportunities for the students. So uh, lots of hands are up. So I I, I think in the order, uh, I'll take Paul. Um, I think Jonathan was first. Okay, Jonathan. Yeah, I don't have an order on my screen. Jonathan? Sorry, it took a minute to, to unmute. I think actually Mike Mike was first, but um, I, I don't <laughs> mind just dropping my comments in quickly and, and then allowing others to talk. Um, I I I between the kind of B and C, I, I you know I definitely think it what we we should do whatever we can to kind of minimize crossing of traffic paths with students. But so between B and C, I, I like the distributed the the option that had the more distributed kind of play areas and outdoor learning areas. I just think there's something, um, you know, a little bit uh, uh, easier for kids to get to a little bit more equity for each, you know, each group of, of classrooms. Um, I think the other thing I like about it is the one where they're all to the north, um, given that, that much of the year is cold and that time of year also has really long shadows that, that you know, some of those play areas, if they were all in the north, would would tend to be, uh, I think, more in shade in that kind of November, December, January, February time time frame. And so, I from that perspective, I will also tend to to favor uh, the one that's up right now, B one. Um, and then the the last comment I'll make is, I know it's something you haven't gotten to yet, um, but just to kind of nudge uh, nudge you towards looking at the the exit. Um, off off our site and whether uh, there's some flexibility and I don't know maybe moving that exit a little bit further to the south does that help with stacking of traffic on um, on the streets um, just something I don't want us to, to kind of lose sight of as we're looking at at, at site um, and site organization thanks Mike and then Paul you know you're stacked up on my screen and Reverse Paul, order. Paul can go. I've already spoken quite a bit, so I'll go after Paul. 
Okay, uh, so uh, I agree that I, I like B1. I think, you know, I'd be curious about um, uh, Rupert's opinion, like keeping all the sort of area that this field area that has to be maintained might be more efficient if it's all connected. I understand what Jonathan's saying about us, you know, separating them out. I do like the idea of the cafeterias on the south side of the building that you have your queuing there um, for the buses. I think there's there might be some access that makes it easier there. But my preference would be to start looking at that B1 direction. So Mike and then Tammy, I see that your hand is up also. So, so I agree with a lot of the comments separating, you know, just the traffic flow of kids and buses and cars is, is really important to us. Um, can you flip forward to some of the B and C, just because I think the distinction that, um, yeah, exactly. So um, having the two field areas, I'm just thinking of the number of students in the school and the, you know, potential advantages of, of having um, areas where younger kids and older kids might play in different areas. Um, so that that's sort of on my mind, I also start thinking about site costs when I think about separating those areas out and, and thinking about some of the some of the elements of the playground areas that both Tammy and I really liked uh, in one of the schools we saw. And you know, if there's a cost difference, that that's where you know the rubber will meet the road. Is if we want these things and it's the it ends up being less expensive to have one larger area versus these two. I think that's where things will get interesting. But in general, you know, the separation of of traffic and kids is the highest order of magnitude for me. And I think when we get to the other, again, I like the idea of having some separation, you know, given that the well, five-year-olds and 11-year-olds in the same building, um, and they may have different desires and needs of use of some of the spaces. Tammy? Um, what, I, what I notice about B versus B1 is the longer queuing area for uh, for cars for fa for the student pickup. What I like about that is it would increase efficiency, um, much like what I have right now at Fort River. Um, and so it would be interesting to hear how long with with the shorter queuing system, if it would take longer or what that would look like. Um, it's particularly when I think about uh, days with really inclement weather, it, you know, it would be nice to be able to have kids getting into cars really, really quickly and really efficiently. Um, when it comes from the, the separated playing fields, I, I also appreciate that uh, just because, you know, as Mike mentioned, it allows for more flexibility, also allows um, for more opportunities for outdoor learning. So you, students may not necessarily have to be on the same field where other kids may be playing. And then if I was a community member, it, you know, I might really appreciate having the kill, uh, kill, field still very close together. So if I had multiple kids, I, you know, one's here, one's there, but then you still sort of have that separation of space. Um, and I guess I could make the argument to having the fields all in the same area. Um, just, just real quick, Tim, I don't know if you want to describe how the circulation is. The the in original intent, if you go back to maybe the one with the smaller queue, yeah. Do you want do you want to walk through? Because I think the low this the drop off to the south was intended for buses originally, so that you had a very long queue for for parent drop off. Yeah, right? as imagined, this queue would cover cars, parents picking up or dropping off would have the queue from the road all the way to the drop-off loop to uh, the northern extent of this loop. And then there's a small separation if necessary to break it up. There could be a separate path for vans, uh, separate yet again from cars and buses. But yes, buses would be to the south with the larger turn radius. They could either turn and exit to the southern entrance, which we are looking at, or go to the north, and then cars would do the loop of the property and drop off here. Um, and then with these two access points from the western loop and the southern loop, um, we start to think about what the best way to get into the building is, where the entrance is, what the collection point, if it's the cafeteria, if it's on the north or south side. Um. Sean, is your hand up again? Yeah, um, one of the, I was just talking about the field location. 
one of the reasons that maybe I like B a little more than B1 is, um, and I'm not trying to get a sense of how big that baseball field is, but in the option where all the fields are there, if you have somebody playing baseball or softball, it might limit all the other field use. Um, I know at Groff, sometimes it's like that, where when we play softball, the fields kind of run into each other. Um, so this this option I like better because it allows you to, you got baseball going up uh, north and then a completely separate sport um, to the to the east there. And it, I hope they wouldn't, you know, there's no chance that they would run into each other. I, and just to let you know, I believe the dimensions of the field to the east is for your ultimate Frisbee. That That's the, uh, the legit size, right, okay. Tim? For ultimate. That is, yes, that is the size for that, for, for lack of a, a specific program about um, what is actually going to happen. But it is large enough that there could be two um, smaller U8, U10, U12 soccer fields on it. Um, but, um, you know, all of these aspect ratios and sizes can be adjusted. Rupert. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, uh, I, I'd like to make sure that you're envisioning um, something like a dozen full-size school buses plus uh, up to half a dozen uh, special ed vans in the queuing area for the public transport. Uh, and I'm concerned about the, short, the shorter loops to the south not being able to uh, have that capacity, but I don't really have a sense of scale. Thank you. So I, I'll just, I'll ask it as a question in one of the schools um, for the delivery of supplies to the cafeteria or w w wherever, you know, people are bringing in, in things. Um, would, whether it's B or B1, would that be in that loop? Is that where a, a delivery truck would come? Is so not during the same time as buses are queued in there is, because that, that I'll call it brown area all around the school, that's not a roadway. That, so the only road you have is either the very front or on the side, correct? Mm -hmm. um, correct. So these are both imagined with service being off the loop to the south. Um, I will admit is not rendered perfectly in the fact that there would be sure. hardscape going to the building at some point. Um, and with this, option on the screen now option b it is likely that the cafeteria would face north and so there would be um a necessity to cross a corridor with um deliveries absolutely if there were a different model um where the cafeteria faced south uh, there, there could be an adjacency that would get rid of that possible or necessity to cross the corridor with services. But, um, you know, the uh, proximity of a loading service area, uh, as well as design next to a playground is something we would have to consider. Um, and that's one of the things that will help us choose between these options. Phoebe. I may have missed this, but where was the play structure area on option B or on any of the options? So the, the spaces distributed around are all sized such that they could interchangeably be structured play with the poor surface that you saw in the schools that we visited or various types of outdoor learning spaces. Um, and then the spaces in between could be hardscape that was painted with game lines uh, or square, as you saw at both schools. So these elements are designed to be, for lack of a better word, placeholders for the uh, outdoor classrooms and play areas. And Tim, um, just for discussion purposes, the way we've um, drawn the meandering, you know, uh, stormwater management, uh, little uh, rain gardens or whatever, that can, can, can we redesign that? Can we relocate that? Does it have to be in that area? Or, or are we saying that's a beautiful design feature that might enhance the site and could also be used for learning? 
it 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 is flexible. It, uh, all of the play and outdoor learning could be on one side. Uh, the stormwater management features could create a boundary between play and outdoor learning and the athletic fields. Uh, it's entirely possible that these features also could be incorporated into spaces that the if you want to keep kids away from them um, for whatever reason, they could also be incorporated into traffic islands um, or the drop off loop or off to the side of the building where they're still doing their purpose close enough to the building and the site elements to collect the water and do what it has to do. But it doesn't have to be central to the kids experience of the site, but um, we see it as an opportunity. So that's how it is currently shown. So, so if there's a I think someone said, are those bridges that the kids going to have to cross bridges to get to the play areas or whatever? So, you know, we'll have better graphics, better images to show the width, the size, the um, is, is there a cost every time you have to do a bridge? Rupert, are you going to have to plow that bridge every every time just so the kids can access? Right. So so I think what we're trying to elicit from everyone is, and we'll continue to develop them. I kind of, um, we'll come up with what, what do you like for learning areas? Where do you want those in proximity to the academic spaces maybe? you know, How do the kids exit the building? And kind of, again, that separation of play and learning so that you can have recess going on while you have learning going on in another area. But, um, and then, and then how does the whole thing flow and how is it all managed or maintained? So these are just, I think, more to solicit thoughts about, do you want everything together? And then it all flows in one direction. Does it make sense to disperse it? And, and then how, how does the drop-off pickup function on the site as well as deliveries back back of the house discussion, where's the trash, where's where is all of those activities going to occur? Um, but I think these are just, they are intentionally illustrative just, just to solicit ideas. Okay, I think we have time, Phoebe, we have what, time for one more comment and we have invoice and we need to do public comments. So I, I'm just conscious and I'll get, we'll make sure we post all of these um, so people, will have the visual that they can go and get it out of the packet. Phoebe? I was just gonna say, um, I think what, what Needham did, what we saw on Wednesday that Needham did was similar to what you guys are talking about or what you have planned here. And it, if someone who is clearly smarter than I, who took some pictures of what Needham did with their stormwater around the front of their building, that uh, was really beautiful. And for educational purposes could be used during those times where there is water in it. Um, you know, I think that I, I like that idea. Um, so maybe if somebody who has pictures could share them with the committee um, so that we can, you know, it might not be exactly like that, but something similar to it where they had the bridge over and those kinds of things. Um, and I think especially because we're talking about not just the green space, but adding in, you know, the play structures and, and blacktop and that kind of stuff in between it. I, my feeling is that to have it separated out like B with the longer loop on the south, I think, and have those uh, play spaces separated out or the green space separated out or whatever um, is probably where I would um, fall on the side of which one of those three. And the longer loop is a possibility with a, a more distributed um, arrangement of outdoor learning and play space. Uh, so, we will uh, work on that and, uh, now that we have a slightly better understanding of uh, or taking steps towards eventually reaching that understanding of what we want to achieve, um, we will go back and rework these options. Thank you. So um, we have one invoice, correct? We do. I'm gonna just pull it up. It's, it's, um... It's answer advisory's invoice for uh, the month of June. And here we go. 
So um, as ever, I think everybody knows, so we do our billing on an hourly basis. This is uh, Ramona updating the website, um, Bob Stevens um, doing uh, monthly reporting and participating in the procurement meeting and then myself. And then I'm just gonna scroll through the detail quickly. Just lists, you know, what, not expecting anybody to read this in detail, by the way, um, but it just, it's our, our method of uh, hourly recording of time. So the total is $16,065. Someone want to make a motion or ask questions? Make so a moved. motion. I move to approve. Second. Um, is there any discussion? And Sean oversees all of these, so he knows what the master budget is. So then seeing no discussion, um, I'll do a vote. And I'm going to do it this time just by the faces I see on the screen. Uh, Tammy? Yes. Paul? Yes. Ben? Yes. Mike? Yes. Rupert? Yes. Sean? Yes. Phoebe? Yes. Simone? Yes. Elisha? Yes. And Kathy is a yes. It's unanimous with, I, I didn't see, did I not call Jonathan? Maybe Jonathan. He, he's somehow in the attendees at the moment. Jonathan dropped out. Yeah, I see him there. Uh, I have to bring him. I, I just promoted him. him. Okay. Jonathan, when you come back. <laughs> Jonathan. There we go. Sorry about that. My phone eventually died. And, and when I came back, <laughs> and I was in, uh, a panelist. Uh, I, I, I approve. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy, uh, one quick thing. Um, I, I do have a picture I can pull up quickly that I took at the Sunita Williams um, in reference to what Phoebe was saying. So Phoebe, this is the kind of what you were thinking of wanting to share pictures of, right? This is some of the outdoor uh, teaching space and this is this kind of uh, dry rock bed that is used to manage water. Is that the kind of picture yeah. you were talking about? Yes, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I can send that around. Yeah, and I took some too, so we can create it. And it's there's a rain garden aspect to this as you do it. And this is the, it's partly, there's a front of the building and the back of the building that they did. There's this east and west that they did differently. So in the play structure area, there weren't a lot of bridges. There was one bridge leading you to an amazing path. <laughs> yeah. The town of Wellesley helped them do along with AmeriCorps or some volunteer group. I, it wasn't yeah, just. And, and sorry, Kathy, we, we too took quite a few images. And again, having um, Bill Brown as a landscape architect, you know, he can also weigh in and provide, you know, additional images. We were just a little under the gun and pulling yeah. this together for today. No, yeah, that's fine. So are there any other, Margaret, was your hand up for the picture? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, if there are no other comments, um, then I think I'll open it for public comments. And uh, Chris Riddle has his hand up um, for whoever is managing it. Hi, Chris, you have joined us. If you unmute, Chris. Um, back to uh, the lead chips question. Um, all right, give me a second here. Um, is there a is, is there a requirement for a educational dashboard in both uh, certification programs? That's a question. Um, then either one, is there any, is there a prohibition to selling RECs? Um, we're allowed to sell RECs under the zero energy bylaw. I'm curious to know whether either, either LEED or CHIPS allows you to do that. <clears throat> uh, 
there the lead the zero energy bylaw requires recommissioning after 12 months of new operations excuse me and it requires a peer review at at substantial completion um, is there the, how does that those, how do those two requirements jive with uh, either chips or lead um, <clears throat> since we're uh, de design build design bid build um, we will get uh, bids from all kinds of general contractors. Um, can we, what, on what basis can we reject a, build, a bid as um, non-compliant? That's a question I came across many times in my professional career. Um, almost done. Um, the photo of the canopies over the parking lot do not show on the site plan, PV canopies on the parking lot. Um, I noticed that the one school that we saw that uh, had PV conspicuously in it did not have it over the can over the parking lot either. But I suspect with a three-story building, we're obviously going to have to do that. Um, uh, when will we see where those canopies go and what is their extent? And... Last question is uh, the, I, I don't see on the site plan, the well fields for the ground source heat pumps. Uh, is, is there, do we have, have, you, have we thought through where that goes? Those are my questions. I have a lot of net zero questions, which I'll reserve for the next, uh, for the meeting of the net zero subcommittee. Thank, Thank you. you, Chris. Um, Bruce, uh, Bruce had his hand up. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, Two comments, one related to the site visit yesterday, which I was actually fortunate enough to be invited to attend. I think Jonathan was unavailable and and my professional experience was, uh, uh, I was invited to join and I appreciated very much the opportunity and also meeting uh, five members of the design team and Margaret who I had never seen before. And it was wonderful to feel that we are in such good hands, actually. Um, so one comment related to the site simply on the systems. Uh, I, too, could go on for quite a while about this. But the, the most salient thing for me, which hasn't yet really been said, I think, is the, uh, the Needham School was a largely fossil fuel-driven heating and cooling system, and it was quite complicated to manage. And uh, it was only because of the seemingly extraordinary capability of the uh, superintendent there that it was even possible. And, and as has been reported, it wasn't even perfectly attuned. Lexicon School was quite different. Um, and it's, uh, as has been said, it's, it's, uh, it was wonderful to be able to see uh, an experience, uh, uh, an example of what the design team is proposing for us. And it was, in, um, um, it was really very uh, reassuring. Uh, we were able to appreciate uh, the value, I think, of what uh, the design team is proposing for us. The, the heating and cooling energy is distributed through the building um, using hot water and uh, cold water in circulation in pipes circulated by pumps. And this is all related to a, a ground sourced uh, solution, which we seem to be heading towards, I think, based on what we are seemingly uh, hearing about what the nature of Eversource's support would be. So this was, uh, I think, quite relevant. It's no longer a, a pipe dream. Um, circulating that water to, to, to the bulk of the spaces and then uh, basically converting it to heat and cooling in the spaces uh, using these uh, chilled beams. Uh, the, uh, Tim was able to point out to me what a chilled beam is. Now, I've seen chilled beams diagrammatically in, in various buildings in Europe and so forth uh, 20 years ago. And this is not uh, your grandfather's chilled beam, I found out. Um, this is a really interesting, aesthetically uh, uh, agreeable, completely quiet, really wonderful system for distributing heat and cooling into spaces. And uh, it seems to be, according to the superintendents in the school, um, a very effective, very functional, um, completely quiet, and the flush mounting in the ceilings and integrated with the tiles is very attractive. But for me, this, there seem to be a, a couple of other benefits, and this is where, for me, it got quite interesting. And to be able to discuss this with Richard and, uh, and Tim uh, particularly, um, 
the incidental benefit seems to be that uh, what the first one seems to be that distributing the heating and cooling using pipes and water and so forth takes so much less space in the ceiling plenums than ducts would, so much less space. It gives us the flexibility to lift those ceilings and maybe even, uh, as, as was discussed, uh, incline those ceilings toward the exterior wall, which would give um, greater and perhaps you know, noticeably greater uh, opportunity for emitting daylighting because you, the exterior wall, uh, the, where the ceiling meets the exterior wall, can give you um, uh, an extra foot or two of, uh, of uh, exterior wall space for higher windows, more glazing, um, and really being able to achieve the high level of daylighting that we're trying to achieve. So it's a, it's a functional relationship between this kind of system that we were looking at and the opportunity to improve daylighting. There's a direct line between the two based on the, the greater, uh, the, uh, the, the, the less uh, space consumed in the plenum by things like ducts and so forth. That was very uh, kind of exciting and interesting to me. The second is that uh, incidental benefit is that when you distribute all this heating and cooling hydronically, which is to say using water, um, that means that the air circulation for ventilation is entirely its own master. All of the ducts now that are there are dedicated to ventilation. It's not shared with heating and cooling, which means that you can basically have a ventilation system that is completely in control. Bruce, can I stop you just for a second? And I, yeah. we also have to keep comments. I think Paul is going to say that he's, he's going to need to a hard stop. Paul? Yeah, I have to log off, I think. But I, I think we did agree three minute comments were what we were. Yeah. Talking. So I, I just want to try to keep the comments to three and we'll take written comments, definitely. And the other is the daylighting. I wanted to say that I've been talking to Margot Jones and uh, Margot is prepared to give uh, a seminar for this committee and others. And sometime in mid-August would be a time. So I will, through Kathy and Jonathan, advise on that. But I think we can, this team can do the kind of job on daylighting that we're after. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Um, Maria, you're here and um, we're at, at risk of losing a quorum. So please um, make the comments as short as possible. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Um, I'd like to um, encourage uh, Mike and uh, Ben to bring those policies and operational um, uh, mandates that CHIP might have uh, to the school committee, regardless of whether you choose LEAD or CHIPS, um, and to incorporate as many as possible uh, to make us as uh, efficient a school district as we can. So I think that that has value whether we have to, we have to do it or not. Um, I really need to comment on uh, what I think is a problem of having uh, equitable access of members of the public to uh, the trip that happened, which I'm so glad that you guys did it. I'm so glad that there were there was parents on that, that the educators were on that, and you guys seem to learn a lot from visiting the schools. Um, and while I don't have a quarrel with having a member of the general public not on the committee attending, um, it is problematic that that offer was not made uh, publicly and um, uh, to other people who might have been interested and willing and able to attend and offer some other perspectives. So uh, I would like to please ask that uh, that sort of selective access to uh, uh, discussions with the design team and to opportunities uh, cease. I think that that needs to be, uh, you have to invite everybody and see who can come or nobody. Uh, the other request is I did not see in the packet um, uh, the posting for that, the Eversource program that, that you guys mentioned um, about uh, for geothermal that can have a substantial impact. Uh, on the upfront capital costs. And I'm wondering if that is available, uh, can that be posted in the packet materials as soon as possible so that that can be shared with the public. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, I think that is it for people with their hands up. 
So unless there are other comments from the committee, um, we did take all of these down. Um, and just on the, the posting, um, I have an email that I will convert to on the uh, whatever source is offering. And it will also be in a slide next week, well, but I will post that. I just didn't get around to it this week. So that's my delay. Um, we did hear back from them. And Dinesco has translated the incentive to what it would mean if we if we can achieve it All right, and we can ob obtain it. So I think I think with that we are adjourned. If I don't hear anything else, so we are adjourned at ten thirty-five on Friday morning. Thank you, everyone. Bye.